welcome to another episode of Integrity Matters by Turning to. My name is Chooks, and today with me in the house is Margaret Berman of Deakin University. Margaret, can you tell us a bit about your academic background, your role as professor, and the Centre for Research in Assessment and Digital Learning? Sure, um, and thank you so much for having me. I am. Um, I have a very uh, diverse academic background. I started off working in um, health informatics, of all things, then ended up in digital education and health, then expanded out to clinical education and have moved um, finally into general higher education, although I still have a very strong interest and still do quite a lot of work in the health domain, particularly medical education at the moment. Um, and um, so my role at, as a professor at Deakin is twofold. First of all, I do research. That's um, the fun bit. And the other bit, which is also fun, is I have a role working in translating some research, doing some evaluation work for Deakin to try and see how its, particularly its digital endeavours, are um, are. Uh, working, um, how they can be improved and um, sort of engage in a dialogue between research and practice. Perfect. Uh, thanks for that introduction. And just with the current climate we're in of the pandemic as we know it, um, how has this impacted assessment and how has Deakin pivoted to support um, learners and academics with assessments? Well. The pandemic has turned everything upside down and I, I don't know, um, I'm sure if anyone who's an academic is, and particularly in Australia is listening to this, you'll know that when it hit, it was right at the start of semester, we had to jump in the middle of teaching online. We had a bit more notice, I think, than, than our other colleagues in the sense that we knew it was, we, we got in at the start of semester, but one of the first questions were all the questions around assessment. What, what are going to happen to grades? How are students going to be impacted? Um, how can we do certain forms of assessment? So invigilated exams were completely off, out of the out of the question, off the radar. And, um, and uh, a lot of forms of embodied exams. And it may not... Um, if you work in a part of the university that this isn't an issue for, some parts don't. It may may not have felt like it was a big impact, but there are, are some parts of the universities, things like uh, Deakin still teaches um, film, celluloid film, so darkroom facilities completely off bounds, um, and the associated assessments, dance performances off bounds, completely um off-premises. So there is a lot of embodied examination and formative assessment and, in fact, learning tasks that were completely um, upended. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that sounds like a lot of work in terms of, uh, especially when we're dealing with enrolment numbers and how you're going to restructure things to fit in with uh, student engagement and all of that. Um, and I know that I've been to a, a a couple of really informative sessions with Cradle. Um, so I'd, I'd like to introduce Cradle in this um, uh, interview. Um, so can you tell us what Cradle is and how that as a, as, as a, as a, a body or a concept is supporting the university? Yes. Yeah, so interestingly, Cradle's remit is not as a university support um, beast. It is to be a centre of research, a centre of excellence. We are um, a group of higher education researchers um, who undertake um, new ways, I think particularly new ways of, of thinking about assessment and digital learning. And part of that is in order to inform what the university does. And as I said, I have a role that's specific within that. And part of that is also to um, drive the global agenda. So I guess, if you like, we're a join between Deakin's local agenda and a global um, agenda about assessment in research, in assessment and digital learning. Okay. Um, so I think you already mentioned a little bit about this when you talked about formative assessment. I'm curious to hear about um, how assessments have changed since the pandemic. Have there been more formative uh, um, as opposed to 
summative assessment, or is this, is this still the, the same way it has always been prior to the pandemic? Yeah, there's no question that it has really changed. I think that many people have put in, have divided up what was once a big assessment into smaller assessments. And I think that that has been, um, my feeling is it's probably fruitful in terms of learning, if not in terms of workload. Um, I think that the other, of course, the other big shift is all of those assessment tasks are now online. And um, that brings in a whole level of challenge in terms of um, having to think differently about what constitutes um, collusion, how group work is going to run, all those kinds of things as well too. So I, I really do think the whole assessment um, equation has been really turned around and that end of year final exam where you sit in a big exam hall with people walking up and down looking at you I think we've seen for many folk that will go and never come back. Uh, so we're just going to move a little um, step further and I know your um, current role is with um, clinical education so um, can you share with us some challenges um, that the institution or the university has faced in um, digitizing clinical education and maybe share some successes as well. Sure. So clinical education is an interesting one. And my current role is interesting with respect to clinical education because the bulk of the work that I do is um, hands-on in terms of clinical assessments is looking in the um, in the postgraduate arena, because that's a research research side of things. Although I still am always interested in, in what's happening university side. So the biggest challenge has been some many assessments simply um, cannot go online. So anything that's around a placement um, in clinical education, if you're going to learn to be a nurse, you need to be in a nursing environment. It's not enough to simply um, digitise. So it's a whole host of work around um, making sure that access to placements are still available. That seems to mostly have worked out within clinical education. Other forms of education, such as teacher ed, are much more impacted. Then there are other um, university side forms of practical skills, particularly practical education that has needed to be digitised. Um, and again, the more embodied it is, the more skills-based it is, the more difficult it is to, uh, to digitise. We have seen uh, a few successes, and I, uh, um, I believe in digitising OSCEs. So that's to say OSCEs have run virtually. So people aren't in clinical education, OSCEs an objective structured clinical examination. And it's a series of skills, clinical skill stations that you rotate through, say, every 10 minutes. Maybe there are 10 stations every 10 minutes you go around them and you do something different. You might take a history. You might um, ask a patient to teach a patient how to use a, a, a puffer, all that kind of thing. Mm. And those sorts of things, I believe, they've managed to digitise um, more or less successfully. But it's a bit predicated on um, on having the students um, being taught the skills in the first place and getting access is very difficult. So I think I, I think um, when it's just a matter of assessment, it's not been such a problem, but actually hands on first teach those clinical skills, it's it's really hard. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, just curious to also hear from your experience, especially in clinical education, has there been an increase in more role-based planning in terms of learning? I know that we're, we're now in a, in a bubble where we can actually um, meet and talk to students face-to-face. -face. Um, so just looking at the clinical education spectrum, um, would you say that there's an increase in role-based learning and, and how is that supporting student outcomes and learner experience as well? Um, not in Victoria. <laughs> you cannot meet someone in Victoria. Um, I, I think we've, you know, there is still some practical learning going on, but I, I think role plays out. But I actually think the difference with clinical education is access to clinical environments has been okay. So the biggest jump in role-based learning and simulation has been around COVID management. 
So, for example, um, learning how to put on PPE, simulation has come into its fore. Um, a lot of work in hospitals about managing workflow of people with COVID has been run through simulation. And that's been a huge jump um, due to the pandemic. Because oh. obviously, you, it's not something you want to learn before you've had a go. Mm. Mm. That's quite interesting. I, I see how the pandemic has actually created uh, an opportunity to learn how to do uh, put on PPE and that simulation. Um, so I'm also um, wanting to get your input in when we look at, I know your, your focus, you're also a, re a researcher, and I'm just trying to get a sense of um, what are some best practices in applying research in um, when we're looking at assessments, especially in enhancing learner experience? Okay, so I've um, done a big research project some years ago, um, which is called um, the Assessment Design Decisions Project. And really what we looked at is uh, thinking about how to improve assessment design on the ground. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is what does, I, 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 I find the word best practice difficult. What does the word good practice look like in your particular context? Because as the pandemic shows, um, a blink of an eye, everything can change and you have to adapt to what your situation is. So in that work, what we did was we looked at the sorts of questions and considerations you had to make about your particular situation. So I think optimising what you can do within the confines of your um, constraints is really important. One of the things we noticed that people who were very successful in um, assessment innovation was that they were very strategic about it. They set out a long time in advance to um, work out how their changes were going to be enacted and not exactly I'm going to do this change and this is what's going to happen, but they really thought about who they needed to persuade, who they needed to bring on board to make the assessment changes um, happen. And that could be heads of department, it could be students, it could be colleagues, um, but really thinking it carefully through. So it's not like, bang, this is something I'm going to do now. Yeah. Uh, I often find that using a phased approach instead of a big bang approach is actually the best way when it comes to assessment, especially when we're looking at um, improving the iteration of um, assessments as well. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, with uh, the need to apply research, like you mentioned, the assessment design decision research, I hope I got that right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, would you say there were, or uh, what, theories come to mind that supports the successful delivery of um, these assessments in the online space? Well, theory is a really interesting question because I think theory intersects with not just what the theory is, but it also intersects with um, what the course is, who the academic is, because theory tends to work with what your view of the world is. Um, so, for example, a lot of people often in um, in digital education will look at self-regulated learning. It's a very specific sort of theory. It's a great theory um, and it really promotes students' um, ability to regulate their own learning as kind of a way forward and um, at distance when there, when there aren't the supports of, of, um, uh, of uh, you know, the physical spaces that it may be even more important. But that's not to say it's a theory for everyone. Um, so I would have to say that um, one of the best ways forward when it comes with theory is to, is to read and read deeply and to work out what works for you and your course. Mm -hmm. Something like self-regulation, I think earlier we were, we were talking about the arts and about creative writing and those kinds of things. That may not work so well in that particular context. It may not work so well in a dance context, for example. So there are all sorts of um, nuances that come in when you need to use theory yeah. or work with theory, probably better than saying use theory. Okay. Um, my takeaway from that is theory intersects with course and the academic. So yeah. you've got to think 
uh, uh, pick and choose and make sure that it works for you as opposed to uh, just using a theory like, like in this case, self-regulated uh, self learning. Um, with the clinical education and with the, the pandemic, um, how would you say the role of, how would you envision clinical education moving forward? What's going to change? Will we be will we be moving to more digital education as opposed to um, face to face or a mix of both? And um, would you say uh, institutions of higher learning are prepared to deal with the the, the changes that that would come with um, something like a pandemic? So I'm, I, one of the things that really interests me at the moment is this notion of how we adapt teaching and learning, both clinical and non-clinical, for what what is, I use the term post-digital world. And post-digital world really means a world whereby everything is mediated by technology. Very few things aren't mediated by technology. And if, like me, in the moment you're in lockdown, that's particularly true. So I think that this change is accelerating. I think the pandemic has accelerated a change that was happening anyway. But I think that we have actually not taken advantage of it. I think the thing about living in a post-digital world is that what we need from our education has also changed. And I think this is where we are least prepared. The sorts of things we need to do to live and work in a technology-mediated world are not yet well taken into account, I think, in learning and teaching. They're somewhat, but not entirely. And I think this partly sits at the intersection between disciplinary teaching and um, higher education. And I recently have edited a volume called Reimagining University Assessment in a Digital World, and what we found, and that was really a book looking to say, well, given that we live in this digital world, how should we do assessment differently? Because we tend to do it in the way that we've always done it. And I think it was really interesting that edited volume, what everyone really struggled with was um, reimagining. Yeah. When you haven't, when you've done, always done something in the way that you've done it, doing it differently is hard. But we know that the world has changed. We know that um, the way that we work has changed. We know that the way that we live is changed. Um, from when I was born to now, I mean, that it's, it's an entirely different um, landscape, social landscape. So ensuring that we can think for the future is, I think, one of the hardest challenges that we face. Mm, yeah. All right, I just want to say thank you for sharing that. I know that we are living in a very fast um, paced um, world. That's the way I'd like to see it. And with technology and the need to um, continue uh, education as we know it, and or with some improvements uh, when we're looking at online learning. Um, you shared some really valuable points, things that we could take into consideration as ac academics and teachers and anyone who's listening to this. Um, so I'd like to say thank you for your time today and looking forward to um, I'm reading through the, your articles, your research paper on, on how you're reimagining re assessments and looking forward to collaborating with you in the future as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>